Hey, Cypher here, and today I've got a weird one for you. Every once in a while I like to go down a research rabbit hole, and then I find an interesting story behind something that I was just curious about. It always starts with the same sort of question, basically, why did something happen? And today, I want to talk about one such hole I dug. Hey, wait a minute. Since when is Pismo Beach inside a cave? I wonder, uh, you know, I just bet we should have turned left at Albuquerque, and then maybe... You see, I grew up going to a Unitarian Universalist church. This is not your normal Christian sect. Not at all. In contrast, I was raised in a Lutheran church, which is pretty normal by comparison. That was Grant, the casual historian, who was doing his own episode on Lutherans in America. The Unitarians, on the other hand, kind of don't have a defined theology or really any belief set that you can fixate on. In fact, it's almost the lack of a defined theology that defines them. My religious education when I was growing up was about going to other religions and finding out what they were about. You know, like going to Protestant sects, a mosque, both Mormon and Jewish temples, Catholic mass, and even a couple of days at a Buddhist temple. I never really returned to the UUs once I became an adult, but that religious education has really stuck with me. So when I later became a history major, I was surprised to find out that the Unitarians were once one of the most if not the most powerful sect of Christianity in America at one point. Thomas Jefferson had said, I confidently expect that the present generation will see Unitarians become the general religion of the United States. Almost a century later, a Unitarian minister was called the preacher who saved the nation. And I remember thinking once I learned all that, how could a religion that was more concerned about teaching other religions than its own history have come from such an exalted position? I didn't know. And in the process of trying to find out, this is what I dug up. Unitarian Universalism is very different from what it once was. Universalism was joined in 1961, well after Unitarians had fallen from the height of political power. So I'm mostly focusing on Unitarians here. Unitarianism was originally a form of Protestant Christianity that believed God and Christ were separate beings. Jesus Christ! What? Get the Escalade, we're out of here. This was in specific opposition to the primary theology of Christianity, where the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, are seen as one thing. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Goat. G g ghost. There is a long history of anti-Trinitarian thought, but until the Reformation, these beliefs were normally persecuted out of existence. Even Muhammad was opposed to the Trinity. He said, Say not three, cease. It is better for you. Allah is only one God. But let's just skip to England in the 17th century, where Unitarians usually trace their lineage. John Biddle, who is often called the father of Unitarianism, died while imprisoned for his beliefs in 1662. Even though there were many before him, the infamy of the intolerance against him spread. His writings and beliefs became a movement. They were still persecuted by the Anglican Church, but it could not be stopped any longer. Even when the Toleration Act was passed in 1689, Unitarians were exempted. It wouldn't be until 1813 that Unitarian beliefs were allowed in Britain. Unitarians couldn't hold office, could be fined or imprisoned, and even have their congregations broken up by the police up until 1813. The belief was kept alive through secret movements in academia, as a kind of radical theology for more progressive thinking students and professors. They were not a coherent group, but Unitarians were sometimes Congregationalists, Arminians, and Arians. These dissenters wanted tolerance, and that became a key part of Unitarian theology. The New World colonies allowed for much more tolerance, and many English dissenters fled there. By the early 18th century, Unitarian preachers were easy to find. During the Great Awakening of the 1730s and 40s, they were opposed to the angry sermons given by New Light revivalists. 
Their liberal beliefs did not allow for blanket condemnations that the revivals of the Awakening fostered. The New Light preachers turned their condemnations to Unitarians. But instead of reacting badly, the Unitarian preachers said things like, An enlightened mind, not raised affections, ought always to be the guide of those who call themselves men. These liberal sentiments kept Unitarians popular among the learned elite. Lutherans, on the other hand, were very conservative in their sentiments and theology, which reflected in their social isolation from English colonial society as well as later American society. Unlike the Lutherans, the Unitarians were still a disjointed group without a singular name. A kind of renaissance man named Joseph Priestley came to America because of religious persecution in England. He was famous for many things, including the discovery of what he called deflagisticated air, but we now know as oxygen. But that was just idle doodling. As he said, My favorite pursuit is the propagation of Unitarian beliefs. He wrote a letter in 1774 proposing the term Unitarian be used for all these disparate groups. Many were not ready for institutionalization and new religious movements were still affecting the American Unitarians. As movements like deism became popular in the revolutionary period. I mean, look at the Hubble telescope. It's discovered untold wonders of a vast unexplored universe, but not one picture of a guy with a beard sitting around on a cloud. I mean, what's he doing up there? People like Jefferson began to believe in a form of Unitarianism. Not to be outdone by the likes of Jefferson, Adams was a practicing Unitarian, along with his son. In fact, we've had four Unitarian presidents. While there was a lot of rumbling about Unitarians because of such affiliations, the church was not yet the most influential one in America. But the beginning of the 19th century would change that. Harvard was originally founded as a seminary school. It was also the foremost college in the United States, even then. Though it had branched out from that original purpose, the Divinity School remained its most powerful institution. In 1805, Unitarians captured Harvard with the election of Henry Ware, making the school heavily Unitarian. This caused some folks to flee the Divinity School and found their own Calvinist schools. With Harvard captured, the top seminary in America was under the control of Unitarians. Soon, many other seminaries would follow. You have to remember, religion dictated many colleges at the time. Ware kept Harvard non-denominational, as was part of the whole liberal sentiment of Unitarianism, but the influence was obvious and very strong. It came to the point that the entire Unitarian faith was openly debated throughout the country. These debates became known as the Unitarian Controversy. It was such a big thing at the time that most of Boston churches were Unitarian. When the Second Great Awakening began, Unitarians didn't involve themselves, and were often seen as an alternative to all the revivalism, basically because of the whole rational liberalism that defined their faith. So they became increasingly prominent even while debating their own principles. A good example of this was a Harvard alumni named William Ellery Channing. He basically defined what it was to be a Unitarian for generations which led to the creation of the American Unitarian Association in 1825. He refused to join, but the leadership of the new organization followed his word closely. The AUA was also extremely political. It pushed for the abolition of slavery and women's suffrage by the 1850s. This caused much trouble with the older clergy like Channing, since they didn't think an organized body of Unitarians should wield such power. This was difficult enough, but there was another shakeup brewing in Harvard. A Unitarian named Ralph Waldo Emerson published an essay called Nature in 1836. He said, The happiest man is he who learns from nature the lesson of worship. With that, he blatantly stepped from the church to found his own group called Transcendentalists. This is essentially a philosophy more than a theology. Its name is a reference to Kant. Yes, that's right, Kant. That's how you pronounce it. Not Kant, not Kant, not Jones, but Kant. It's a German name, and I'm quite happy to sit here in silence until you're mature enough to get over it. The whole idea is similar to the cynical virtue of happiness. But instead of mere happiness, it is meaning that one derives from nature. Transcendentalism led to some of the greatest American literature of the time, including Walden from Henry David Thoreau. 
It was the first truly American philosophy, which Emerson declared just that when he said, We will walk on our own feet. We will work with our own hands. We will speak our own minds. Then shall man be no longer a name for pity, for doubt, and for sensual indulgence. The dread of man and the love of man shall be a wall of defense and a wreath of joy around all. A nation of men will for the first time exist because each believes himself inspired by the divine soul, which also inspires all men. Despite Emerson calling the church the corpse-cold Unitarianism of Harvard College and Brattle Street, the movement was intrinsically linked with Unitarianism. Most of the people who attended the Transcendental Club remained Unitarians, but this infused a dangerous ideology into Unitarian theology. This spiritualism would lie in wait, eroding from within the cohesion Unitarians had just achieved. But for the time being, they were still powerful. The accomplishments of Unitarians prior to the Civil War would be too much to list. For instance, the American Anti-Slavery Society was founded in 1833 by a Unitarian. The Seneca Falls Convention that began the women's rights movement in 1848 was replete with Unitarians and Universalists, and its declaration of sentiments was heavily influenced by Transcendentalism. And Thomas Starr King, the preacher who saved the nation, was a Unitarian and Universalist who used his liberal faith to campaign against secessionists in California during the secession crisis. For a century afterwards, it was common for Californians to consider him the reason why California did not join the Confederacy. But that is pretty reductionist. Unitarians remained prominent during the Civil War as well. They were abolitionists after all, so they heavily sided with the Union and provided much political support. For instance, Mary Livermore, who was already a major women's rights advocate, pushed the creation of the Sanitary Commission, which provided for medical relief and began modern field medicine in America. And she happened to be a Unitarian. The war also brought the Unitarians and Universalists closer together in common cause. But things changed after the war. A rising tide of spiritualism swept the nation. Seances and spiritual healing were already popular before the war, but with the deadliness of such a war, spiritualism came back with force. It eroded Unitarian and Universalist congregations from the inside. Why are you dedicating your life to blasphemy? Don't worry, sweetheart. If I'm wrong, I'll recant on my deathbed. Hello, my animal friend. <gasps> My Satan sense is tingling. Compounding the problem was the growing reliance on secular schools. Harvard was less and less influenced by its divinity school. When Charles William Eliot became president of Harvard in 1869, he pushed the college into becoming a research university, thereby removing the Unitarian influence of so many prior presidents of Harvard. The united power of Unitarians ebbed away as more people left the church. Lutherans, on the other hand, were a bit different. At the same time, Lutherans were busy Americanizing themselves, switching their administration and services from being mostly in German to being in English. The Lutherans were essentially gaining a small amount of political power, just as Unitarians were losing it. New organizations were formed, but not with the power that Unitarians wielded before. They were prominent proponents of the social gospel movement that led to progressivism in the early 20th century, but they were just one of many, and not the most prominent, as they had been with abolitionism prior to the Civil War. The church became increasingly liberal, to the chagrin of many former members. After floundering in membership for decades, they combined the Universalists to become the Unitarian Universalists in 1961. This boosted membership significantly, and Unitarianism has become a refuge for people ostracized from other faiths. The liberalization of doctrine continued to the point of having no formal theology, and many members today are non-Christians. For instance, the largest polytheistic organization in America is CUPS, or the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans. A rather ironic thing if you think about it. Though UUs don't wield that hefty power they once had, they are still a major force for social change. Reading Black Lives Matter, standing on the side of love, are posted on the side of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in San Luis Obispo. The more people that are able to see it and sort of engage with the questions that it raises, um, we, 
we think that that has great promise. It's For instance, they have always been at the forefront of various rights campaigns, including the recent agitation for LGBT rights. They were doing civil unions while it was still illegal. This activism follows directly from UU principles, which are the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another, and encouragement of spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and finally, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. You can kind of see some of the old influence such as transcendentalism and, you know, Unitarian and Universalism as separate groups, but obviously it's evolved to be much more liberal than even what it was in the 19th century. It's an interesting group with a fascinating past. So, if you'd like to see the opposite side of this dynamic, the Lutherans were actually very conservative, and that's what Grant's video is about. So be sure to go and check that out. The Lutherans were never really a powerful organization in America, almost for the exact opposite reason that the Unitarians were powerful. So be sure to click on Grant's video, and I'll see you next time. Oh man, that's some strong stuff. Oh boy.